Welcome to our next episode with Geopolitics with Alex. And uh, today I'll be dealing with a current affair, basically the visit of President Xi Jinping to Moscow this week. It was a three-day visit and uh, we will try to look at it first with a short introduction and then five key points uh, and a conclusion. Uh, by way of introduction, I think uh, it is safe to say that the war uh, is in a stalemate. We are looking uh, at a prolonged war situation which has now lasted for one year and one month and is most likely to continue for the foreseeable future, at least until the end of uh, this year, perhaps even longer. Um, the visit of Xi Jinping was significant uh, for many reasons. And here I'm not only talking about the pomp and ceremony uh, in the Kremlin. I, I've been part of it myself with the long lines and the high ceilings and uh, the lights and the rugs and, and the rest of it and the flags. But there are many different issues here. And the five I've chosen to address today, the first one is what's in it for China or what was in it for China. Second, what was in it for Russia. Third, what does this mean for Chinese-Russian relations. Fourth, what does this mean in the tension between the global West and the global East. And then fifth and finally, why is it important to look at it also from the perspective of the global South. And I'll try to raise these five points before I then conclude. So here we go. The first point is on, on China. Now, China and President Xi Jinping wanted to frame this uh, internationally and domestically into a peace mediation or peacemaking uh, trip. Uh, I should add that this is his first trip abroad since he was uh, re-elected um, uh, chairman of uh, the Chinese Communist uh, Party. Uh, you will know and remember that China had put forward a 12-point peace plan, um, which of course in reality wasn't really a peace plan, but at least it created an image of we are here to mediate uh, peace. Uh, there was, of course, uh, an important event uh, last week where um, China had mediated uh, a peace or an agreement, at least, between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Of course, completely different in nature. But basically the message was that here is a superpower in the form of China, you know, being able to deal with international affairs and, and help out. But if we scrape the surface a little bit, it's very easy to understand that basically the political support that President Xi was given to Putin and Russia was there only really to cement this new relationship between China and Russia, where I personally believe that it's big brother and small brother or big sister uh, and small sister. Uh, I call this basically pro-Russian neutrality. So China doesn't want to go the full mile in driving and showing its support to Russia. It wants to remain neutral for reasons that I will address a little bit later. But nevertheless, it is a pro-Russian approach. I think it's exaggerating to say that this nailed the relationship and it's all about being pro-Russia. It's more complicated than that. So basically, Xi Jinping does not want Putin to lose uh, because his biggest fear is, of course, that there would be then a Western-minded Russian leader which could potentially then uh, isolate China uh, from Russia and, of course, then from uh, the global West. I think the moment was a little bit awkward for Xi Jinping because, of course, Putin had been issued an ICC, International Criminal Court, uh, arrest warrant. And, and this doesn't you know, feel very comfortable. So Putin is basically going to shaking hands of you know, Putin, who is now following in the footsteps of, say, uh, Milosevic uh, and others uh, in uh, being caught by the ICC. 
And in many ways, you could say that what, what China wanted to do was to get political leverage, trade leverage, and uh, energy uh, leverage. But very much, I think, senior partner and junior partner, unequal partners. And this will cement the relationship for a while to come. Here is where I come to point number two. Okay, if China stood to benefit from this both domestically, internationally, and with its bilateral relations with Russia, what's in it for Russia? Well, I think this was important for Putin. Obviously, domestically, because he could, you know, show that, look, the West might be isolating us, but I'm not alone. Here I'm standing with one of the great leaders in the form of President Xi Jinping. I mean, it went so far as to Putin sort of with his sly little smile, uh, flattering Xi Jinping and saying that, well, you know, I am actually quite envious of the success of China. Well, I mean, I'd be as well if I had had a similar sized economy in the early 1990s and I'd be lagging tenfold behind. But the bottom line is, of course, that he was trying to kiss up to, to Xi Jinping. Uh, and this is all for Putin, a transition and a shift uh, of economy towards the East. You remember that Russia was partially dependent, of course, on trade with the West and certainly um, trade in, 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 in the energy sector in the form of uh, gas and oil, now it has to shift those resources. Things didn't go as well as he probably wanted on, on this front, but nevertheless it's a clear sort of pivot uh, to uh, the East. Putin obviously was praising the 12-point peace plan of, of, of China. Why? Well, because in that peace plan, which is completely unrealistic, there's no withdrawal of troop, but troops, but there is a call for the West to end sanctions against Russia. I mean, it's a little bit like being in favor of, uh, you know, peace uh, and, 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 and all, all the nice things in the world. Uh, and obviously, he would support it. So in many ways, I would say that Putin got political support from Xi Jinping, but economically, there was no deal on a Siberia 2 pipeline. There wasn't that much, uh, you know, concrete efforts on on the trading side, and, and this just shows, I think, the strategic game that, that Xi Jinping uh, is involved in. So China wins uh, and cements its position, uh, and then Russia gets a little bit of political support, uh, not much more than that. Uh, point number three, what then does this mean for China-Russia relations, or what I have called previously the global east. Well, the first thing to observe is that there was again a document, actually, or, or a comment letter that paradoxically, I mean, this is really uh, quite good doublespeak, uh, it talked about, and I quote, peace, development, uh, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom. Well, you know, not exactly words that you would connect with Russia at the moment. Uh, you know, peace, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom. And you can question some of those terms with, with, with China as well. But nevertheless, there was that letter. But there wasn't that, you know, letter that China uh, or the two presidents, Xi Jinping and Putin, had uh, issued uh, during the opening of the Beijing Olympics in, in, in February 2024, where there was talk about friendship without limits. Why is this? Well, because I think China was actually taken by surprise. I don't think Xi Jinping knew that Putin was going to uh, attack Ukraine. And the reason I say this is that they didn't seem to have speaking notes on how to react. The reaction of China was quite slow. And secondly, they hadn't had time to evacuate Chinese nationals or citizens from uh, Kiev. So not a good one. Uh, I think, you know, for China especially, but for both, there are two reasons why I think the relationship right now is utilitarian but uncomfortable. The first one is that, you know, they have to talk about territorial integrity and national sovereignty. So, you know, think kind of Taiwan there. And of course, Russia violated blatantly national, uh, territorial integrity and national sovereignty. S the second one is 
this discussion of indivisible security, which basically means that, you know, don't touch Russia, don't touch China. It's very much along the narrative of, of, of Xi Jinping's global security uh, initiative. So it's not a comfortable position for Xi Jinping to be in, but I do think that he actually managed the situations, uh, situation uh, quite well. So my argument is on Chinese-Russian relations that for China, uh, it was difficult but useful, and for Russia, it was actually dangerous and useful, because it is now quite clear that there is this sort of symbiotic relationship between the two, but the symbiosis is sort of more of a lifeline for Russia than for China. So China can use Russia, but Russia is dependent on China. And I would say probably not exactly the outcome that uh, Putin uh, wanted. And here is where I come to my fourth point that, you know, what is an additional underlying theme to the visit? It's the tension between the global West, which I define as the EU, the US and their allies, so a quarter of the world's countries, uh, and the global East, which I define as uh, China uh, and Russia. I think what we're starting to see, I'm not saying yet that this is a proxy war, but it's sort of a proxy situation. So there's clear sort of support for one side uh, or uh, the other. At the same time, I do see this, the war in Ukraine as a battlefield for the new world order. One of the theses in, in my book, which we will continue to talk about in, in this lecture uh, series. Uh, the reason that China is moving very carefully and having this sort of, you know, support for Russia but stay neutral approach is that China is still very dependent on the West. I mean, the figures that uh, you can use many, of course, but it's about, you know, 800 billion in, in business with, with the West, whereas it's only 80 billion with Russia. And of course, China doesn't want to get those uh, secondary uh, sanctions. China is also playing this global game about portraying itself as a global mediator, successfully or uh, unsuccessfully. And what it's trying to do with this visit is to say, look, me, Xi Jinping, I'm here to mediate peace, but look at those Americans and look at those Europeans. You know, they're belligerent, they are aggressive. So he can kind of use this uh, and, and put the global West as, as uh, warmongers. One of the uncomfortable things for Xi Jinping, of course, in this war is that he always wanted to put a uh, wedge in between the US and the EU. I mean, that was part of his strategy because he understood that the Americans uh, are going to be much more into decoupling relations and seeing China as a threat, whereas the Europeans could still play the game a little bit. Well, he now realizes that the war has actually brought the US and the EU so closely together that it's unlikely to see a split. I'll give you an example. Remember, there was this 17 plus 1. So Eastern and Central European countries working together with China, 17 of them and one from China. And, you know, that doesn't really de facto uh, exist uh, anymore. Uh, now, there was a moment, uh, you know, around Christmas or before the new year, where China and the U.S., we're getting a little bit closer to each other. Remember Biden uh, met Xi Jinping uh, in the margins of, of the G20 meeting in Bali. Uh, there were statements from Xi Jinping about, you know, don't do the nuclear thing, direct message to Putin. Uh, but I think this sort of got all put behind, unfortunately, because of the incident of the high, shoot, the, the Americans shooting down the high altitude uh, uh, balloon. And then suddenly the Americans were saying, well, you know, China should not be selling weapons to, 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 to Russia. There will be ramifications. And this hasn't happened yet, but, you know, dual goods or not, you could still see a, sh a shift in, in, in the mood. So the basic message of China right now is that China is the peacemaker and U.S. is the warmonger. Of course, we know that that's uh, not the case. Uh, but, but, you know, we are also in the situation, and the Chinese and Xi Jinping certainly knows this, that neither Putin or Zelensky 
wants peace right now. This is going to be fought out in the, in the battlefield until one of the sides, Russia or Ukraine, basically sees that there is no avenue forward. My fifth and final point is about the global south. And here I come back to the thesis of my book. If the competition for the new world order for the next 10 years is about the global West wanting to support uh, the liberal norms-based, rules-based world order and the global East, Russia and China wanting to change it to more static or authoritarian system, the game is going to be decided by the global South. So Asia, especially India, Africa and Latin America. Why do I say this? Now, I find it a little bit strange that the global South wasn't really mentioned in a lot of the uh, international media uh, discourse that we saw around uh, Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow. But I, I think the Chinese and the Russians were trying to play to the global South audience. They have understood that global South is going to be the one that decides this. If there was a pendulum swinging between the global West and the global East, it's the, the global South which decides in which direction uh, it will uh, go. So, you know, China and Russia were playing to the audience of uh, the global uh, South. Now, uh, I think the global South is, their neutrality in this situation is genuine. And I come back to the thesis that I've put forward before. Only 40 countries in the world have sanctioned Russia, and they're all from the global West. Zero countries from Africa, zero countries from Latin America, and I think only one or two from Asia have sanctioned Russia. So the rest of the world is not as emotionally attached to this war as we are uh, in the West. And here's where I come to, to the key point. The global West must understand that this is about more than only Russia and the global West. It's also about the global South and the new world order. You see, the global East, Russia and China have understood this. And I don't think that there's that much time to waste. Uh, the global West needs to up their game. And I'll come back to this in my conclusion, which is uh, the following. I think we should be thinking about settling into a long war. This is not going to be over anytime soon. Um, it is as much about the winner and the loser of the war on the ground as it is about the emerging new world order. The old world order has died. So we have begun an era which can be, you know, which is the, the, the post-Cold War era has ended. We have begun a new era which we haven't named uh, yet. I think Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow was a strong message. It tilted the political support to Russia uh, more strongly than it had done before. So now they're neutral, but on the side of Russia, if that is uh, possible. And I think now the ball is in the court of the global West. How are they going to react to this new situation where we can clearly see a closer political alliance uh, between China and Russia? And in the background, this sort of game with the global South at the same time. So if I may give a piece of advice as a humble academic uh, to world leaders, I think we're now in for a fight for the hearts and the minds of the global South. If I was in office, which I'm not, uh, I would actually go for a coordinated global tour in the global South. So if I was a leader in the global West, I would sit around and say, okay, who is going to go to which country to win over the global South in this debate? The time of arrogant, post-colonial, aggressive and moralizing foreign policy towards the global South is over, if, that is, the global West wants to win the fight for remaining and holding on to a norms-based uh, uh, liberal world order. While they are looing, working with the global South, I think the West still needs to maintain its relationships, relationship with China. What the balance is going to be, how it's going to turn out, I don't know. So my point is, and I'll finish with this, I think Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow this week was very important. 
number one for China, number two for Russia, number three for the relations between China and Russia, but also number four for the tension between the global West and the global East, and number five for the role of the global South. Stay tuned, we're going to continue the analysis of geopolitics uh, in the coming weeks. America made its declaration of independence of the world.